may. You know, if Calvinism is true, you cannot tell the sinner God loves you unless you know that he is unconditionally elected of God to salvation. And I've I've encountered a Calvinist from time to time while out witnessing, wanted to argue with me about what I was doing. Don't really have time or patience for that. But they wanted to let me know that I could not tell people that God loves them because he only loves the elect. I just want to say tonight, I'm glad that salvation is not a lottery system. I'm thankful tonight that salvation is not a sweepstakes. I'm thankful tonight that salvation is not only for a select few who are foreordained before the foundation of the world. If it were any of those things, I certainly would have been left out. I do not, I'm not Irish. I'm not lucky. I've never won anything in my life except for a board game, and that's because I cheated. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad what we're going to tell you about tonight isn't from the Bible. Because if it was, it would make God a very inconsistent being. And so let's pray and get into God's word this evening. Lord, we are so thankful, God, that you love us. We, we certainly, God, we certainly don't deserve it. We don't deserve your salvation. We don't deserve your grace. We don't deserve any of the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. Uh, Lord, but we acknowledge tonight that you are good. You're always good. You're only good. And Lord, your goodness is extended to us in a million ways every day. And Lord, we're grateful for that. We're thankful for that. We're thankful tonight for the scripture. For the light of your word, God, we're thankful tonight for the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. We're thankful for this place in which we can gather, and we're thankful for the people who are assembled here. And we're asking right now for your guidance, Lord, for your blessing, uh, God, for your help as we study your word together. May Jesus Christ be praised in all that is said and done, and may you receive the glory and honor that you deserve. Help us, teach us, guide us, direct us, challenge us, Lord, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. will be the first passage of Scripture that we look at tonight. I have probably more to say than you care to hear this evening. And so we're going to try to be mindful of time, but I really want to be a help to you tonight. We're going to take a look to get started. Hebrews chapter 13. I had also planned to go to Colossians 2, uh, but brother... Uh, Brother Vic did a great job covering that passage as we got started and sure appreciate uh, that opening message to the conference. That was a help and a blessing to us. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number nine. Let's get right to the scripture tonight. The Bible says, be not carried about with diverse and with strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them. That have been occupied therein. We'll say this by way of introduction this evening. I am 100% absolutely convinced that Calvinism is a false doctrine. I am absolutely 100% convinced that Calvinism is a dangerous doctrine. I'm absolutely 100% convinced that Calvinism is a doctrine that needs to be preached against. At the same time, I think it's important we understand that when it comes to Calvinists, those who adhere to Calvinism, there is quite the broad spectrum. Uh, it's kind of that way in the independent Baptist movement. There are many independent Baptist brethren that I wouldn't want to be judged according to their beliefs are way of doing things. You understand what I'm saying? When somebody thinks of what is an independent Baptist, there can be a lot of different definitions of some of which that I, as an independent Baptist, am not so thrilled about. Yeah. And I believe, to be fair, the same would have to be said of Calvinists and of Calvinism. They're there are a number of different flavors. There, there's a wide variety of beliefs 
and of practices and of degrees to which these doctrines are taken to their uh, to their logical conclusion. I mentioned already most of the Calvinists that I've had interactions with were people who wanted to argue with me when I was out publicly proclaiming the gospel and trying to pass out gospel tracts and preach to people passing by and witness one on one. And those interactions have not been of the most pleasant variety. But I understand, and I would have to admit this evening, there are also some Calvinists who are serious students of the Scripture, yeah. who love the Word of God and love to study the Bible and love to teach the Bible and are zealous about defending the Christian faith. Sure. And some of them adhere to the doctrines we'll be uh, discussing this evening. Honestly, I believe that's some of the appeal that Calvinism has. It's making somewhat of a resurgence, and I believe it looks different today than it has perhaps in years gone by. I believe there may be a segment of people who've become somewhat disillusioned with, um, maybe we could call it fundamental Christianity, having grown up in churches or in circles where there was a lot of emotion and maybe there were a lot of rules but there wasn't a whole lot of Bible doctrine right. and it left them hungry for the truth and searching for some answers to some legitimate and sincere questions. And I believe many of those people have found the intellectual rigor of Calvinism somewhat appealing. And many of the uh, Calvinist preachers and Calvinist authors will systematically go through the Bible verse by verse and expound upon the word of God. It's something that uh, sadly has been missing from many Bible-believing independent Baptist churches for far too long. So there are some Calvinists who are serious about Bible study. It, it doesn't make sense, but there are some Calvinists who preach the gospel. Probably the most quoted man in a, in a Baptist pulpit would be the Prince of, of Preachers, Charles yeah. Haddon Spurgeon. Right. And he was a great evangelist and a great gospel preacher. He wrote an excellent witnessing book called The Soul Winner. Yeah. And he was a Calvinist. Okay. I think it's important we understand that. Now, there are also those, we might call them hyper-Calvinists who carry Calvinism to its logical conclusions. And they don't pray because it doesn't make any difference. And they don't witness because why would you? And they really don't do much of anything. And they've got this great doctrinal excuse for their laziness and their lackadaisical approach to Christianity we don't have to do anything. God's going to do everything. And they really live that way. There are some who take it to that extreme. I would say as a danger, there are also those who get caught up in the intellectual realm of Calvinism. They become very heady, very high-minded, very puffed up in knowledge, which the Bible says is not edifying. I've also noticed this kind of this modern resurgence of Calvinism. There is a branch that as much as they embrace the doctrine of the reformers, they seem to embrace the lifestyle of the reformers. And that's not necessarily a good thing in many respects. I mean, Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, 95 theses, he said the evidence of God's love is beer. There, there's a lot you can learn from Luther, and a lot of it's by way of a bad example, right? So there's this branch of Calvinism where it seems to be as much about beards and brew as it does about Bible doctrine. There, there, it really is. You just need to be aware of that. It's more about kind of a casual approach to Christianity more so than it is about living a holy, sanctified, God-fearing, and God-serving life. Now, why did we start with Hebrews 13, 9 to get back to the passage? Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, 
not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. I think we need to acknowledge this and recognize this. There are people, there are people in our independent Baptist churches who have a tendency to be carried about, as Ephesians 4 would say, with every wind of doctrine. And they tend to get occupied in strange doctrines. And it's not a profitable endeavor for them or for the body of Christ in general. And the Bible said we need to be careful about that. It is a very real danger. Here's what I want to say to you tonight. The devil will use anything to get you and your family out of a good Bible preaching church. He'll use some sort of sin or habit in your life if he has to. He's done that many a time. He'll use some kind of conflict between you and your brothers and sisters or even between you and the preacher if he has to use that. But let me tell you tonight, he'll use theology if he has to. Anything he can do to get you out of a good Bible preaching church, he really doesn't care. It doesn't make any difference to him. You got to be careful about getting occupied in strange and diverse doctrines. And this is one of those doctrines that has infiltrated some good churches and taken some good Christians and getting got. You just knocked them off track where they were following the Lord, serving the Lord, serious about the Christian life. And it got derailed by this philosophical system by which the Bible becomes interpreted. Listen, we all have to be careful. We can't bring our system of theology or our system of philosophy to the word of God. We've got to get all of our beliefs from the word of God. And that goes for Calvinists and independent Baptists alike as one just as well as the other. Now, my topic this evening is unconditional election. We're going to explain what that is and why it's not a Bible doctrine. Um, I plan to go back, if necessary, give a brief history of Calvin and of Calvinism. Brother Vic did a great job with that in the first message. Let me just go and, and give you a little bit of history of the tulip acrostic. While you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and verse 1, we'll read another verse on why that history that Pastor Vic gave you is so important. Then we'll talk about tulips. Uh, first, and we're not going to tip to, we're just going to stomp through the tuba patch this week. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse number one. First Corinthians 11, verse number one. The Bible says, be followers of me, the Apostle Paul speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We are told in Hebrews 13 to look for spiritual leaders whose faith we can follow, considering the end of their conversation. And, and Paul said, mark them in Philippians 3, which walk. So as you have us for an example, he said, look, guys, you, you are safe following me as I follow Jesus. I just want to say this this evening. I definitely don't want to follow Christ the way that John Calvin did. Heard a little bit of the history, a little bit of the error, a little bit of the practice. And, and here's what we need to understand. Biblically speaking, doctrine and practice are really inseparable. Where there's a an error in doctrine, there will be an error in practice. And I believe the converse of that is also true. Where there is an error in practice, you can be sure it traces back to an error in in doctrine, I don't know why any Bible believing Christian would want to be identified with a man who has the track record in the history that John Calvin does. Now, where did this tulip come from? Because as much as Calvinism did not originate with John Calvin, the tulip acronym or acrostic did not originate with him either. In fact, it didn't uh, come around till early 16. Hundreds. You see, there was an influential theologian in the 1500s by the name of Jacob Arminius, and uh, his teachings and his theology uh, had quite the influence in the Dutch Reformed churches of the Netherlands. Now, following his death, his followers summarized his teachings in a document that was called the Remonstrance of 1610. It had five points of what came to be called Arminian 
doctrine. And those teachings began to spread throughout the churches to the extent that in 1618, there was this assembly convened and it was called the Synod of Dort. And the purpose was to answer those five points of Jacob Arminius's teachings. And from that synod, that convention, that assembly came a document that was called the Canons of Dort. And so five doctrines of Armenianism were challenged, were opposed, uh, were argued against with five doctrines that came to be known as Calvinism. Now, it wasn't until the early 1900s that some Calvinistic writers uh, renamed the doctrines and reorganized and shuffled them around to come up with what we know as tulip theology. It's been very popular ever since. So tonight we're going to talk about the U in tulip, which is unconditional election. And what we want to know is what does the Bible have to say about it? Because look, I'm not a Calvinist and I'm not an Arminian. I'm a Bible believer. I want to be a Christ follower. I don't want to get my system of teaching or doctrine or thought from any man. I want to get it from the word of God. Now, praise the Lord. God's given us pastors and teachers to help open up the word of God to us and help us learn the things of God and serve the Lord with one another. But tonight we're going to look to the Bible and ask ourselves, does unconditional election have any biblical basis? So what unconditional election is, is this teaching that before the foundations of the world were ever laid, that God in his sovereignty, and that'll be a key word this evening, God in his sovereignty made a decision, made a selection. He chose whom he would save and whom he would not. The teaching of unconditional election is that your salvation, my salvation, the salvation of any man anywhere at any time in history is ultimately and entirely a matter of whether or not God chose for that individual to be saved or to be condemned. According to unconditional election, it is not possible for you to get saved if you're not elect. And according to unconditional election, it's not possible for you not to get saved if you are elect. Okay? Now, what we would think on the surface is that the doctrine of unconditional election would be tied to the Bible doctrine of God's foreknowledge. That the explanation would have to be that God foreknew who would be saved and thus elected or chose those individuals to be saved. But when I went back and read Calvinistic writers to have an accurate understanding of what they, that's not what they believe at all. To the Calvinist, election is not based on foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is based on election. That God did not elect those he foreknew would be saved. The reason he foreknew that they would be saved is because he had elected them. Okay. So there are some, there are some broader and more foundational concepts that we have to understand in order to get to unconditional election. And the first of those is what we mentioned, the sovereignty of God. It's really a buzzword for Calvinism. Anybody that uses sovereignty a hundred times in their message, you can bet your bottom dollar they're a Calvinist. Okay? It's not a Bible word. I don't necessarily have a problem with it because it's not in the Bible. After all, the word Bible's not in the Bible. And I do believe the Bible. Trinity's not in the Bible. It is a Bible doctrine. Rapture's not in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible. But the doctrine of the rapture is in the Bible. So the word sovereignty is not in the Bible. I really don't have any argument against that. The argument I have is the meaning that the Calvinist attaches to it. Like Brother Vic, Vic said, we could take the word total, take the word depravity, define them in the dictionary, and it fits what the Bible says. We can take the word sovereignty and find it in a dictionary, and it absolutely fits God. Sovereign means... In the dictionary, it means supreme 
in power or in efficacy. I'd say that God is sovereign. I'd say his power is supreme. I'd say he is able to do whatsoever he pleases. That's Bible truth. Sovereign means possessing supreme dominion. Possessing supreme dominion. Sovereign means superior to all others. God's sovereign. Now, in that sense, in the dictionary sense of the term, oftentimes a king or a ruler or a magistrate would take the title of sovereign. And in the dictionary sense, supreme in power, possessing supreme dominion, God is all of those things. He's the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 4, 8, the creator of heaven and earth, Romans 125. Before all things and by him all things consist, Colossians 1, 17. He's the blessed and the only potentate, 1 Timothy 6, 15. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He possesses supreme dominion. Absolutely no argument whatsoever with that. God exercises that dominion, that power, that influence, that authority, that control over his creation and his creatures. That is without a doubt. That's not what a Calvinist means by the sovereignty of God. Their idea of God's sovereignty is that he directly controls every minute detail in each and every. Every aspect of creation. The Calvinistic concept of God's sovereignty is that the only reason anything ever happens is that God wants it to happen and he wills it to happen. It's all part of this divinely scripted plan for the ages and nothing takes place outside of that plan. And to question that. To question that is somehow to deny God of his sovereignty and dilute his omnipotence. See, to the Calvinist, the sovereignty of God is his overarching attribute. That it, all the other attributes are, are subject to his sovereignty. How about you? I read Isaiah 6 or Revelation 4. Those seraphim, those beasts, they don't circle the throne and cry, sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. They encircle the throne and cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the might of God. I believe that God can do whatsoever he pleases, that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. But I believe that power is exercised in subjection to his holiness and all his other attributes. And it is exercised as defined in his word. He's sovereign according to the dictionary. He's just not sovereign according to Calvinistic theology. Now, based on God's sovereignty is the next concept we need to understand. It's his eternal decree. The eternal decree. This is the teaching that because God is in complete control of every aspect of the universe, everything happens because he made it to happen. He decreed it to happen. Nothing happens that God did not intend to happen. Nothing that takes place is ever outside of God's will. That's scary when you think about it. It's a a very popular phrase. Everything happens for a reason. I saw a sign that I really liked. It said, sometimes the reason is you're dumb and make bad choices. (laughs) Right? So all things work together for good to them that love God. That's in the Bible. What men meant for evil, God meant for good. That's in the Bible. God works all things at the counsel of his own will. Known to God are all his works from the foundation. That's all in the Bible. But it's a huge stretch. It's a huge leap to reason to conclude that because of those things, that everything that happens is God's will. And nothing could ever happen that's not God's will. But that's the basis for the doctrine of unconditional election. Now, before we get to unconditional election, look at a couple verses with me. Isaiah chapter 10. Is God sovereign in the Calvinistic sense? Did he really script this plan 
from eternity past of everything that would ever take place in the history of the world? Does anything ever happen that God did not desire or that God did not intend? Isaiah chapter 10, verse number one. What say the scripture? Isaiah 10 and verse number one. Read this in, in, in light of what we said about the eternal decree. Woe unto them, the Bible says, that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievousness which they have prescribed. Now, it doesn't matter how long or how adamantly the Calvinist tries to deny it, to interpret the sovereignty of God to mean that God causes everything that happens to happen is to make God the author of sin. What we just described as this sovereignty of God, what we just described this as this idea of the eternal decree means that every time someone is murdered, God scripted that. Every time that someone is raped, God planned that. Every time that someone is harmed, someone is molested, someone has a crime against them, that God is really the one who from eternity past said that was going to take place. It all fits into my plan. It's part of what I have intended for the history of mankind on the earth. All the sodomy and sexual perversion, you can get mad about it all you want is red blood in America, but according to Calvinism, God planned that. All the killing, all the stealing, all the violence, all the wars, every disaster, every catastrophe, every pandemic is not just allowed by God, not just permitted by God, not just used by God. According to Calvinism, it is caused by God. It can't not happen because it's part of his plan. The Bible says, woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees. The God of the Bible is not the author of sin. Men blame God for the horrible things that happen to them in this life. According to Calvinism, they're right. According to the Bible, it's sin working in our members and bringing forth death and destruction on every end. Look at Jeremiah 19, Jeremiah chapter 19. This verse doesn't make sense. If we believe the Calvinistic concept of God's sovereignty and eternal degree, Jeremiah 19, verse number five. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 19, verse five. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings and a Baal. Look, this is God speaking. God speaking, which I commanded not nor spake it. Neither came it into my mind. It's not just once. 32, 35. Jeremiah 32, 35. Maybe some of you parents have had that experience. I didn't even think not to, to tell you not to do that. That's what God's saying here. Jeremiah 32, verse number 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Molech which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this an abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, let me ask you a question. If everything that happens, happens because God decreed it from eternity past, because God scripted for it to happen that way, to all fit into his plan for the ages, then how could God be true and say twice in Jeremiah, I never even thought of that? <laughs> Are we bringing a philosophical system to the word of God or are we reading and believing the Bible? Okay. Now, unconditional election is the, is the outcome or the result of taking the sovereignty of God and the eternal decree and applying those concepts to the matter of individual salvation. An unconditional election means the reason anybody is saved is God chose him to be saved before the foundation of the world. And if God chose you to be saved for the foundation of the world, you could never end up not being saved because ultimately, here's what it does. It takes away human responsibility. You have no choice in the matter. Your salvation is not conditioned on your belief. Your belief is conditioned on your election. And along with the doctrine of unconditional election is the, is the flip side. Of that if if God chose to save certain individuals, that means He also chose to condemn the majority 
of people whom he would ever create. The other side of the doctrine of unconditional election is called the doctrine of reprobation. That God created millions, billions, and billions, and billions of people for the sole reason of sending them to a lake of fire for all eternity. It's supposed to be a vindication of his justice. Is that a Bible doctrine? Can we find that truth in the word of God? Did God create people just so he could send them to hell? Let's find out. Revelation 4, Ezekiel 33. Revelation 4, Ezekiel 33. I want to move quickly because I really want to do a little bit of preaching at the end of this. Revelation chapter 4, try to make this practical for us tonight. Revelation 4, Ezekiel 33. One of the struggles is there's so much to say, but if we just throw verse after verse and thought after thought, none of it might stick. We want something to stick, so we'll do our best. Revelation 4. Ezekiel 33, did God create people just to send them to hell? I think you know the answer to the question. Let's see it in the word of God. Revelation 4, verse number 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Boys and girls, you're paying attention to that Bible verse. Here's why God made you and put you on this earth. Your purpose in life is to please him. The objective, the ultimate end of your creation is so that you can have a relationship with God that you enjoy. And primarily that he enjoys. You were created for God's pleasure. Everybody was. Everything was. Ezekiel 33. In verse number 11, Ezekiel 33 and verse 11, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil wise, ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So God created everybody for his pleasure, and he gets no pleasure out of the wicked man dying and being separated from him. So how can you say God created some men for that express purpose? Well, you can, but it's not biblical. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said he created hell for a specific group of people. And it wasn't the reprobate. It wasn't the non-elect. It was the devil and his angels never intended for any man to go there. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 and get 1 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Peter 3 with 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Peter 3, 9. We'll read first. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Very clear. If you believe the Bible was inspired by God and preserved by God, and we have just the words that we need, and that every word of God is pure, God is not willing that any should perish, and that means any, but that all should come to repentance, and that means that means everybody. It means all. When somebody dies and goes to hell, they go to hell outside of the will of God. Hear what's so so frustrating to me about Calvinism. Prepare for these messages. I I read some books by people who don't believe in Calvinism. I read some books by people who do believe in Calvinism. I read Arthur Pink's Sovereignty of God. And Pink was a brilliant Bible expositor. He's a great Bible student, great Bible teacher, and and an ultra hyper. Calvinist. And when Pink came to 2 Peter 3 9 or any passage that really clearly went against Calvinism, he changed the Bible. He said that any doesn't mean any, and that all doesn't mean all, and that any is really any of the elect, and all is really all of the elect. And if you got to change the Bible to fit your, your system of belief, why not change your system of belief to f- fit the Bible? That's what we ought to do. First Timothy chapter 2. 
The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Why would we do that if everything was sovereignly decreed before the foundation of the world? For kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good except in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You know, that's what our prayer life is supposed to be about. You know, God wants Joe Biden to be saved. You know, God wants Kamala Harris to be saved. You know, God wants Putin to be saved. You know, God wants Zelensky to be saved. You know, God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. In verse 5, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Look, when I go and I preach the gospel, I don't have to lie to people when I tell them Christ died for them. I don't have to lie to people when I tell them that God loves them. I don't have to lie to people when I can call on them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved because unconditional election is not a doctrine from the word of God. It's a doctrine from philosophies of men. Come to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Man's will absolutely has part in this because God's will is for everybody to be saved. But everybody's not saved. Many do perish. Why? Because God gave them the freedom of choice. God gave them responsibility. God gave them a call and they must respond to that call. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. With that, get John 6. Let's look at these together. Ephesians 2 with John 6. Reading first from Ephesians chapter 2, which you know well. The Bible says in verse number 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Do you believe that? The grace of God is what brings salvation. It's unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't pay for it. It's got to be a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith. What is the only biblical means of grace? It's faith. Your choice, your decision to trust, to depend upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Protestants and the Catholics teach their sacraments, the means of grace, means whereby you can access the grace of God. There's only one according to the Bible, and it's faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not going to take time to argue in Ephesians 2. Is salvation the gift of God or is faith the gift of God? You can read the passage either way. It's still true and holds true with the rest of Scripture. It doesn't point to any kind of unconditional election. But the stated goal of the theological system of, of Calvinism with its unconditional election is an attempt to give God all the glory and all the credit for man's salvation. You see, they say that by, by saying, I chose to trust in Jesus, I placed my faith in Jesus, that you are taking some of the credit, that you are depending upon something that you did. Now, it's a great thing to want to give God glory, but we, got, we can't take it farther than the Bible does. The Bible places that call upon the individual. The Bible places that responsibility upon the individual. The, the jailer in Philippi said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said, Hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Just, just wait and see if you're one of the elect. Now they called him to make a decision. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But the Calvinist twists that to where your belief is a work. To where your faith is something that you did. Now, I would argue from the Bible, it comes from God, just that God gives it to everybody. Okay, but that's somebody else's message. I'm not going there. Uh, do, do come with me to John 6. John 6, verse 29. What does Jesus have to say about all this? John 6, verse 27, the Bible says, Christ speaking, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth an everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father 
sealed. Jesus said, hey, you need to go after everlasting life. You need to do whatever it takes to obtain it. Is that what he said? Verse 27. Verse 28, then said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Hey, you need to do some labor, verse 27. Here's the labor you need to do, verse 29. Believe. And God will give you the faith to believe. He gave the measure of faith to every man. But you got to take that faith God gave you and place it in his son. You don't get any glory for that. You don't get any credit for that. He, he offered you what you can believe upon. He gave himself for our sins. He made it possible for man to be saved. Believing on Jesus Christ is not robbing him of any credit at all. He still gets all the glory. Praise the Lord. Come to the Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations 3 and Philippians 2. Lamentations 3. Three and Philippians 2. We're headed for the runway. Just kind of circling for a little while. Lamentations 3. Philippians chapter 2. Let's try to wind this down with some application. I quoted this a second ago, but let's read it together. Lamentations 3.26. This uh, A.W. Pink, I think, quoted this about 50 times in that book that I read. Lamentations 3.26, it is good. That might have been a slight exaggeration, but it sure seemed like it. Lamentations 3.26, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the, for the salvation of the Lord. Because you see, there's, there's no way to know if you're elect. All you can do is hope and wait. Man, what a way to invite a sinner to come to Christ. Wait and see. My soul is in the balance. This is the difference between heaven and hell. This is eternity we're talking about. Hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Now, now here's the outcome of that. If unconditional election is true and you go to hell, it's God's fault. He didn't elect you. You didn't have any choice. Again, uh, the, the Calvinists, they'll, they'll do all kinds of mental gymnastics to, to try to deny that's the truth. Right. But there's no other logical conclusion. If the only way to be saved is be elected, if you're not elected, you're damned. And I don't damn, it's God's fault. He didn't choose me. I'm telling you, no, no, nobody will stand at that great white throne and shake their fist in the face of right. Almighty God and say, it's your fault I'm going to hell. Right. You want salvation? You can have it. It's available in Jesus Christ. All right. Now come to Philippians chapter two. Here, here's the problem that we want to very briefly address. I believe there are a lot of saved people who aren't Calvinists in their theology, but they're Calvinists in their practice. You understand what I'm saying? They take that whole idea of hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord and apply it to every aspect of the Christian life. Here's what I'm talking about. Philippians 2, verse 13 is another. It, 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 it's a great Bible verse. It's true. Bible doctrine. It is, it is frequently quoted by the Calvinists. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God which worketh in you. This is talking to save people. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And would we not agree tonight that without him we can do nothing? That our sufficiency is of God? That that. That in me and my flesh dwelleth no good thing, that I am utterly and completely dependent upon the power of God and anything good accomplished through my life. He gets all the credit. He gets all the glory because I sure couldn't do it without him. The will comes from him. The desire comes from him. The enabling comes from him. The power comes from him. Anything that pleases God, it wasn't me. It was Christ in me. It was the Holy Spirit in me. But here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean I sit on the couch with a sweet tea and a bag of potato chips just waiting for the power of God to overcome me and make me go to church and make me go and witness and make me give and make me serve and 
make me minister. There are way too many Christians who have this idea. If God wants me to do something, he'll give me the will. He'll give me the desire. He'll make it happen through me. That's partly true. But it's not the whole truth. One more passage. I promise I'm done. Come to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Oh, I'm just sitting back and waiting for God to make me bold. And once he makes me bold, I'll go and be a witness the way that I know I should. That's not the way it works. Second Peter chapter one. Verse number three. The Bible says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to Unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know what verses 3 and 4 say? God gave you everything you need to live the Christian life the moment you trusted Christ. The man of God is perfect, truly furnished unto all good works by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and the Bible with exceeding great and precious promises. God equipped you with everything you need. Is that all the Bible says? Verse five. And beside this. So God gave you everything you need, but it's not enough. There's something additional that is required. And beside this, look what the Bible says, giving all diligence. Whose diligence? That's yours. This is you applying yourself. This is you expending some effort. This is you being dedicated. Where uh, And beside this, giving all diligence. Add to your faith. God told you to do that. He didn't say he was going to do it for you. He told you to add to your faith. Virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. For if these things be in you and abound, verse 8, they make you that ye shall ne neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that lack of these things is blind, verse 9. Wherefore, the rather brethren, verse 10, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Well, that's an interesting thought in light of unconditional election. If it's unconditional, how can I make it sure? Something's gotten twisted somewhere along the line. But, you know, I wrote down 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. We're not going to read them. 12 Bible passages where God said, I want you to do this yourself. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Cleanse yourselves from all unfilthiness. Yield yourselves unto God. Submit yourselves to God. Withdraw yourselves from every brother. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. God's not doing it for you. He gave you the strength to do it. He gave you the power to do it. But you got to make a choice, Christian. you got to make a choice, saved person. Young people, you have choices to make in life, and those choices have consequences. And nobody in hell can blame God that they're there. And no Christian can blame God for their sorry excuse of a Christian life. Get up, get busy, go do something for God. Get in church. Get in the Bible, get in fellowship, get in, get in ministry, and just enjoy this Christian life the way that God intended because he left some things up to you. And your choices are going to determine the direction that you travel and what's at the end of that road.